Certainly happy to be with you again tonight for this discussion, a very important subject. We appreciate the presence of all of you tonight who have come to be with us, and especially those who were not here last night. We have heard tonight about what we heard the last night in the two speeches, more or less a rehash of the same thing, with a little more fervor, I think, but at the same time, he has not produced a verse of scripture that teaches that there is only one person of the Godhead, namely Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I've asked him when Jesus came to this earth, what was in heaven? Who was in heaven? And when he prayed, Father in heaven, there wasn't anyone in heaven. When he taught his disciples to pray, our Father which art in heaven, there wasn't any Father in heaven. All the Godhead was here upon this earth at that time. Only body and spirit, he said. The flesh and the spirit in the body of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He has asked several questions tonight. Some of these have already been answered in previous uh, talks. I'm going to mention a few things and then go to the very heart uh, of the matter tonight. Because this is the last evening we'll be discussing this proposition I was in the affirmative last night. He's in the affirmative tonight. Tomorrow night we have a different topic. In regard to the believing in the Godhead, he began by saying, we'll be lost if we don't believe it. Well, I don't believe it. And I do not believe that the Bible teaches it. Certainly, Deuteronomy 6, 4, one Lord. We've emphasized that. There is one God, one Godhead. And he went to 1 John 5, 7, which speaks of the three, and I don't know why he wants to mention that. I tell you, Mr. Davis, you better stay out of John. He'll ruin you. Because when you read John, and first and second John, and also in the book of Revelation, he'll ruin you. And he mentions some Isaiah and others when we'll group them all together. He emphasizes the fact that God is not a person, that God is a spirit. And I gave in the first speech last night, Hebrews 1 and verse 3, that speaks of the person of God. And 2 Timothy, or rather 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 10, of the person of Christ. And also John 16 and verse 13 concerning the Holy Spirit, He, a person. A person can be in a fleshly body or out of it. And I use the example of the rich man and Lazarus, Luke 16. After they both died, they were still in existence as individuals, as personalities. And they could remember. The rich man was told, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime had the good things and Lazarus, the evil things, so forth. And Lazarus was comforted in Abraham's bosom. God is a person. Define a person, please, for us. And God, what are you going to speak of God as an it or a thing? A person has intelligence, thinks, remembers, reasons. We're created in the image of God, in the likeness of God. Male and female created he them. Genesis 1, 26, let us make men in our image after our likeness. Verse 27, so man was created in the image of God. Daniel said in Daniel 7, 15, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body. This is the teaching of the Bible. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Well, there you've got more than one. There's the mediator between God and man, and that's the man Christ Jesus. There are two already. Why that verse of Scripture? And he emphasizes Ephesians 4, verse 4 and 5, one Lord, one Spirit. And one God the Father, which is true. And in the idea of believing in me, why you believe in the Father. Certainly so, because the Father sent Jesus Christ into the world. Here are a few things I want to notice. Was the Holy Spirit a spirit or a symbol in regard to the baptism of Jesus? In Luke 3, 30, uh, 22, it says, The Holy Spirit descended in a bodily form. He makes it just a bird. And then there was a voice from heaven that said, listen to Matthew's account in Matthew 3. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. Now that's the real bird. 
dove and lightning upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven. No, the voice was from within Jesus Christ. No voice from heaven. And a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. That's God the Father speaking in regard to his Son, Jesus Christ. Again, God the Son. Is there not a verse in all the Bible that says Jesus is God the Son? It says he's the Son of God. Did the Father call his Son God? But of the Son, he said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Hebrews 1 and verse 8. And again, verse 9. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with all of gladness above thy fellows. And that answer that. Person means that he has a bodily presence that you can see. I deny that. An individual can be a person out of the body. And God can exist without being in a bodily form of human flesh. Webster says, body, one of the three modes of being in the Trinitarian Godhead. And Hebrews 1, 3, the express image of his person. Jesus Christ is either Lord over all, or he is not Lord of all, he said. Assertions are not proof, Mr. Davis. He, as the firstborn, is over all creation. Colossians 1 and verse 15. He is not Lord over God the Father, because the head of Christ is God. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 3. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 27, when he saith all things are put in subjection, that is to Christ, it is evident that he is accepted who did subject all things unto him. The two. Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, saith the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Since these three persons make up one God, Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, Revelation 1.8 1, would apply to them all. They're all the one. Indeed, Jesus Christ is eternal, but the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John 1 and verse 1. They're all the one God. They're all the Almighty in that sense. One Godhead, but all possessing deity. Well, he asked, can deity die? Do you teach that the Son of God who died on the cross was deity? Can deity die? Deity who becomes more than flesh can have a fleshly death. And being found in fashion as a man, wrote the Apostle Paul in Philippians 2 and verse 8. He humbled himself, becoming obedient even unto death. Jesus is. God in the sense that he is eternal, but the word became flesh and lived among us. And Jesus died on the cross. And in Luke 23 and verse 46, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He who said he was the first and the last also said I was dead and now I'm alive forevermore. How could just and easily be an honest thief our truthful liar, or a clean, filthy man as an eternal son. He mentioned that idea. We do not speak of the eternal son, but that the son who was eternal, that the word became flesh and lived among us. In John 8, 58, Jesus said, Before Abraham was, I am. The one who said he was dead, Revelation 1, 18, also said he was the first and the last. Revelation 1 and verse 17. Is man in the image of three persons? God. God is spirit. John 4, 24. Man has a spirit. And a man's spirit knows the things of a man. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 11. Alone or by self? Is it possible for one person to be alone by himself and have another with him at the same time? Only in one sense or a figure, which is clearly indicated by the context, of course. And God was in Christ. Well, the characteristics of God the Father were in Jesus Christ as being eternal. And only the mortal flesh died. The Spirit was alive in paradise and came forth from paradise and his body was raised from the dead. When to know was Jesus God? Hebrews 1, 8. Jesus died. Revelation 1 and verse 18. Please tell us how an omnipotent person can be sent where he is not already present. Can there be uh, three persons omnipotent? 
There's a sense in the omnipotence of God. He knows all and sees all. But that has to do with his knowledge. Is God in hell? Well, he doesn't know about those who are in hell. Did Jesus say, Pray, Our Father which art in hell, hallowed be thy name? He said, No, Our Father in heaven. Friends, I'm going to tell you something tonight. The basis of this false doctrine hasn't been in this country very long. And it came about, and here is the manual. He referred to the manual briefly last night. And so I'm going to read from it and show you some things because I do not want to wait till the last speech to do it. <clears throat> this is a serious matter. In the manual, I have a copy of 1985. In the foreword, it says during the last 21 days, of the 19th century, a band of earnest, hungry-hearted ministers and Christian workers in Bethel Bible College, Topeka, Kansas, called a fast, praying earnestly for a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which to their joyful surprise came upon them in the early hours of the morning on January the 1st, 1901. All right. Passing on down to another paragraph, in the year 1914 came the revelation on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the pivotal doctrines of the absolute deity of Jesus Christ, and the baptism in his name became tenants of faith. Now then, in the old manual, it said that the baptism of the Spirit came in January 1900. Now, I want to please the uh, focus on the uh, board in regard to this. And here is the covering of the manual of the United Pentecostal Church International in Cooperate. All right, now let's go to the next one. That's 1969. In 19, let's have the next one, please. In 1969, they said... And I know that's hard to read, but look down towards the bottom of the page. It has it January the 1st, 1900. Now let's have the next one quickly, please. And in this one, you have 1985 on the cover. And this is the copy that I have in my hand. All right, now then, let's go to page 13 again. And here is what we have on that. Look down to what I'm reading near the bottom of the page. It came in January the 1st, 1901. The Holy Spirit made a mistake in recording the date. First it was 1900. Now it's 1901. The Holy Spirit made that mistake. And down towards the bottom then, in the year 1914, came the revelation. Came the revelation of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the pivotal doctrines of the absolute deity of Jesus Christ and the baptism in his name became tenants of faith. Why, they admit you can't find that in the Bible. It was revealed. The Holy Spirit gave it. The Bible was written before 1914. And Jesus said to the apostles, the Holy Spirit will guide you into all of the truth. John 16 and verse 13. And Peter wrote in 2 Peter 1 and verse 3 that God has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Now then, the Holy Spirit came to their joyful surprise. But they were praying for it. And the Holy Spirit came to their joyful surprise. There it is. And in the early hours of the morning of January the 1st, 1901. And then in the year 1914, he revealed the idea of the name of Jesus. Only one, Jesus. Why did the Holy Spirit wait to 1914 to reveal this? Why didn't the Holy Spirit reveal this through Peter or James or John or one of the other writers in the New Testament? Why wait to 1914 to reveal it? And after the Holy Spirit came in 1901, why did the Holy Spirit wait to 1914 to reveal this doctrine? And all of that he puts up there, and therefore there is one person. 
This manual says the Holy Spirit revealed it in 1914. Then say it came from the Bible. It came in 1914. And it became a pivotal tenet of faith. It became that. It was revealed. Now, that's exactly their doctrine and their teaching in the manual. Then he comes and tries to make out like it's in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. We believe there is one God, but consisting of three distinct personalities. But let me read on. After saying that on the next page, it says literally thousands were baptized into the name of Jesus. The reason why they want to teach the oneness is that they want you to believe that when the individual gets into the water to be immersed, that the administrator must say, I baptize you in the name of Jesus. And if you don't have that said over you, you are not scripturally baptized. And as he would say, you're going to hell. All right. Now, later on, we have it stated, as you have there, and it's hard to see, I know, but let me read it to you. In regard to the Pentecostal church, became closely associated in doctrine and fellowship with some of the others. Then in 1944, steps were taken to unite the two bodies into one organization known as the United Pentecostal Church. Now that's what the manual says. When did they get the name, the United Pentecostal Church, 1944? I told him last night it wasn't in the Bible. He admitted that. Then he said the Church of Christ not in the Bible. Well, the Lord promised to build his church. Matthew 16, 18, upon the great truth that Peter confessed. The different congregations are spoken of as the churches of Christ in Romans 16 and 16. Churches of Christ salute thee. When individuals today follow the teaching of the word of the Lord and the word of the Lord is the seed of the kingdom, that is the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said it doesn't make any difference what's on the shingle on the outside. Well, then why don't you call it the United Satanic Church? Wouldn't make any difference. In regard to the matter. Then over here on page 21, in regard to water baptism, it should be administered by duly authorized minister of the gospel in obedience to the word of God and in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the idea about the matter. Over on the next page, the basic and fundamental doctrine of this organization shall be the Bible standard of full salvation, which is repentance, baptism, and water by immersion in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the initial signs of speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives others. Well, we'll have more about that tomorrow night. But remember, it must be in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is their doctrine exactly so. Well, friends, I'm going to give you something else from this manual. Here is in regard to the ministry. Anyone desiring to be affiliated with the United Pentecostal Church must have the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the initial sign of speaking with other tongues and must have been baptized by immersion in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and must believe in, teach, and preach the same. He's got to do that to be a preacher of the United Pentecostal Church. All right, on page uh, 39 at the bottom, any minister holding or seeking to hold credentials are a license with us who speaks or writes in opposition to any articles of faith shall be called before the district board who shall decide upon the penalty to be inflicted. If he doesn't preach this, he'll be called before the board and the penalty to be inflicted. Page 41 speaks of all ministers, whether men or women. So they have women ministered. These are a few of the things in the manual. Now I wanted you to know that. In regard to membership, page 104, Anyone believing in and accepting the apostolic doctrine as set forth in our articles of faith is eligible to become a member. You've got to believe the things set forth in our articles of faith to become a member. 
I say, if you just believe and follow the teaching of the New Testament, you become a Christian, you live by it, and heaven will be your home at last. People have wondered, what is back of all of this idea about the wonder? So they can get a person in the water and say, I baptize you in the name of Jesus. It is a cult, and a cult of recent origin. And it caused trouble among those who were Pentecostal as the symbol of God, our church of God. But remember, back several years ago, there was Evan G. White, long about 1844, who claimed to have a revelation in regard to the Sabbath day. And then there was Joseph Smith, who claimed to have a revelation. And we have the Book of Mormon. Now, I want Mr. Davis to tell us, is his revelation correct? And the others false. Are all of them correct? If all of them are correct, they differ with him because they believe in the three persons of the Godhead. Now, which revelation are we going to accept? And which one is right? I want to know also, are there any more revelations being made? And if so, we need an addition to the Bible. The apostles were not guided into all truth if this manual is correct. You can't believe this manual and believe the New Testament because the Lord said to the apostles, you're going to be guided into all truth. And Jude talked about the faith which has been once, once for all, revised version, delivered unto the saints. But it wasn't all delivered. It had to come in 19 and 14. A revelation, that's what they said, of the oneness and the baptize in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Then they get up here and quotes these scriptures about Jesus Christ and about God and all like that. Why, well, here is what the manual said. The manual said it came by revelation. Not in the Bible. We got it by revelation. Well, that isn't all. I have here a book written by Arthur L. Clanton of the Pentecostal Movement, A History of the Oneness Organizations, printed by the Pentecostal Publishing House, bearing the date of 1970. So I just want to briefly give you some statements uh, from this one, please. On uh, the very first page, it says it gives a complete history of the oneness organization and the baptism in the name of Jesus. And it speaks in 1945 of the merger and be called the United Pentecostal Church Incorporated in 1945. And the Pentecostal Hera is the official voice of the United Pentecostal Church. All right, let's pass on. Over here on page 15, I have a statement I'd like to read. It was not until 1913, however, that the truth of the oneness of the Godhead was fully revealed. And along with it, the doctrine of water baptism in Jesus' name was first out into the open. When did they get it? 19 and 13, he says. From the Bible? No. Well, let's read right on down. God revealed to him, speaking of a man, John C. Shemp, to him the truth of oneness and baptism in Jesus' name. God revealed it to this man. Did he get it from the Bible? No. God revealed it. Now, friends, that's the seriousness of it. And then he gets up here and says, if you don't believe that, you're going to hell. And he talks about the Catholic Trinitarian doctrine. I have never used the word Trinity in the talks that I have made here. And I did not get those statements from Catholicism in regard to both the Father and the Son. And the Lord saying, God, uh, he's my son. And Jesus praying to the Father and calling him Father. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. But that is in regard to the matter. Then also... Let's pass on and notice something else. Uh, page uh, 21, in regard to uh, uh, many converted to the truth and who have uh, no respect for the Word of God, then it's not complete. He says here, many Pentecostal ministers and laymen were being converted to the truth in their early movement. Well, I'm going to go on over here to page 95 and uh, give you a statement. Uh, concerning this movement. The basic requirement for membership in the Pentecostal Church Incorporated 
uh, according to the bylaws, to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, an initial sign of speaking in tongues. And I've read that uh, to you already. Now, page 121, it speaks of Mr. Witherspoon, who left the committee room and borrowed a typewriter and wrote out the fundamental doctrine, the basic doctrine that the organization shall be the Bible standard of full salvation, repentance, so on and so forth. And then he says, surely he was inspired of God that day. Well, others claim the same thing. If you can't find it in the Bible, then bring it up, write it out, and claim that you were inspired of God that day to write those things. All right, again. It was at this point in the meeting that the name United Pentecostal Church was agreed upon. Did they find it in the Bible? No. It was in this meeting that they agreed upon this name. All right, I'm passing now to page 131 rather hurriedly. And this is the title given to the official head of the United Pentecostal Church. What? The general superintendent. The head of the Lord's church is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and he lives in heaven. But I also have another statement here that I'd like to give on page 141. This baptism must be administered in Jesus' name. That is the one baptizing must say, I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ said, go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28 and verse 19. He takes a statement in 142. Jesus did not mean for anyone to repeat the title Father, Son, and Holy Ghost as a baptismal former. How does he know this? And he also speaks of it. Baptizing in the name. So the organization rejects the doctrine that God the Father, the first person of the Trinity, and God the Son, the second person, to earth to die for the sins of the world. Instead, they believe in Jesus Christ. So here is the basis of it, my beloved friends. Over on page 187, in the year 19 and 12, W.T. Witherspoon received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Three years later, God revealed to him the truth of the oneness of the Godhead and baptism in Jesus' name. Now, if that doesn't convince you, I do not know what on earth could. These are their own men saying that God revealed it unto him. So it's not found in the Bible. Their manual does not claim it. Their writers do not claim it. It was revealed. Well, things have been revealed by others. I want to know some things about it. Well, here is the book also by Fred J. Foster. Think it not strange. On page 25, he has a statement regarding the meeting in Topeka, Kansas, January the 1st, 1901. And then he mentions a Mr. R. E. McAllister on page 51 in regard to the history of their movement and regard to baptizing in the name of Jesus. He emphasized the fact that the words Father, Son, and Holy Ghost were never used in the first century baptism. That is only an assumption. He does not know that. In page 65, he mentions in regard to the meeting in St. Louis, Missouri in 1915 and goes on to talk about the name being agreed upon and the name decided and then on page 89, he mentions the fact in regard the first gathering of this new church was held September 25th, 1945. Now this is their author. And this is what they say. And this has been published. Now here's something else. I had a hard time getting the manual of the United Pentecostal Church. I asked several bookstores and I couldn't get it. Now I'll tell you, if you want to know about the Lord's Church, the New Testament Church, the Church of Jesus Christ, we have our little books. And if you don't have the money to buy one, we'll give you one. The New Testament of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that contains all the truth that you need. Paul said all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is probable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, every good work, all that you need 
is in the Word of God. They had to have a revelation to teach the oneness of the Godhead and to baptize in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Thank you very much.